Welcome to the Engineering Influence Podcast brought to you by the American Council of Engineering Companies. Today we're talking with Simon Dickhead, a principal at the Cox Group in Atlanta, which is a business consultancy focused on the AEC industry. A few weeks ago, Simon presented an online class for ACEC called Why Retention is You and Not Them. You can stream the class on our website. I'll put the address in the show notes below. But today we're going to talk to Simon about some of the aspects of what he discussed. Welcome, Simon. Thanks very much. Appreciate you having me on. So um, let's uh, just to start off with where employees start off. One of the points you made, and I thought it was an excellent one, was that uh, key to keeping good people is having a good hiring system. And it seemed to me from listening to you, there was it's a, it's a rather simple process. One, having structured questions to get the right people in the right job. And then two, making sure that on their first day, you knock it out of the park and make and show that you appreciate they've arrived. However, sure. firms don't seem to do that. Why, why is that? Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. The, the hiring pro and, and the two very, uh, different, but very related things. Um, having the structured questions as part of the hiring process requires, um, several different things. It requires in, um, intent as uh, so you have to be purposeful and plan and coordinate that hiring process between the hiring managers and the people that participate in the hiring process. So for smaller firms, that's a, you know two or three people. For larger firms, that could involve multiple offices and, and the general managers within each of those offices. But the structured questions and, and the data shows, and I mentioned uh, Colquitt in, in the presentation, but there's numerous industrial psychologists that will, will uh, be able to speak to this. By having those structured questions, and being um, consistent with respect to the behavioral questions, the technical questions, and the overall fit uh, that people may have within the, uh, the specific office, but also the values of the organization, you can create far better consistency in the people who come into the organization rather than find yourself influenced by um, preferences and likes and dislikes that stop that, that, that uh, come up within the hour or two of an interview but stop the overall big picture viewpoint of an individual um, and that goes back to and I, I mentioned it in the in the presentation uh, Robert Cardini in influence speaks of we we like people who are like us and if we like them within the first you know, few minutes of an interview, without those structured questions, we have a greater tendency to hire them, regardless of whether they're a good fit for the organization or not. And, and the opposite is also true. They are not like us. They don't have the same viewpoints around technical aspects or values that I have. Therefore, they're not going to be a good fit for the organization. And that also may not be true. They may be a great fit. So that's that first piece. The second piece is all around bias. Um, and when we have a poor first day, it creates an anchor bias that is low uh, with respect to the individual's tendencies, positive tendencies towards the organization and towards the team that they're gonna be working within. And that then becomes an uphill battle for the individual to get to the point of feeling engaged with the organization. The opposite side of that's also true. If we have a knock it out of the park first day, small things are taken care of, like my space is clean. It is stocked with pens and notepads. There's perhaps business cards or some, some form of the uh, company swag that we would tend to offer for marketing collateral. Is there an available for me to use? Um, there is somebody who's showing me around the office, around the building, um, they've given me good connections for places to go and eat for lunch, say. Uh, and my supervisor, the person who I'm going to be spending a lot of my time reporting to, is there and present, or at least makes contact to say, I can't be there today, I'll be there tomorrow or Thursday, whatever the case may be. Small things like that can really elevate that original anchor bias. 
and immediately create connection with the organization, even if it then starts to slide, right? We're starting from a much better position and some of those missteps might be forgiven in two or three weeks time and it may be a blip. Um, there's gotta be a level of authenticity with both the hiring process, but also the onboarding process. With the first point, the, uh, the uh, that we tend to like people we we like and are, or we are attracted to people we like. What does that have dealing with different size firms, as like a small firm, two or three people working in a business together, or a company with several hundred employees? Is that a bad thing in both? Necess not necessarily a bad thing, but can that be a bad thing in both size both size companies? Um, so the, what is going to be important is what's the intent of the practice, right? For a smaller firm where it's a handful of individuals, right? It's a very practice focused um, business. We are looking to say at the end of the project, how do we do? How did the work turn out? Um, oh, by the way, did we make money? And so um, that is going to have a very tight fit, probably more of a family feel but there's still going to be a need for diversity within the people present because there's going to be somebody who's out there winning the work and really projecting the practice and needs somebody back at the office to help support and deliver the work. Within the larger organizations, uh, you sometimes hear the phrase, you know, a, a large company with a small company feel. That may be true within pockets of the organization and somewhat similar things occurring. Uh, although you tend to have more sophistication around the hiring practices, more sophistication around the interview process and the screening process, you're more likely to have the HR department go through the first uh, screening into, you know, the, the resumes will be screened almost automatically based on qualifications. Then there'll be the phone screening, then it'll be handed over to the local hiring manager. And that process tends to deliver a um, group of candidates that meet the company's needs, but then it's down to the fit of that individual with the group they'll be working with. Um, and I mentioned it again in, during the presentation, but it, it remains true. We can teach most technically minded people the technical roles that they need to fulfill. What we cannot do easily is teach them how to fit within the group that is, exists already. Now, if it's a continuation of the um, values that we have already put in place and we're building on that team uh, dynamic which may have more of a family feel if that's what we want or it may have more of a practice feel if that's what we prefer but it's going to be building on um, then the answer might be different than if we're intentionally trying to shift the way in which we view the practice and the way in which we actually practice to become something that's different at some point in the future, right? And so we're entering an evolution process. The answer of the hiring structure is gonna be different for those two questions. One of the points you made, uh, a lot of different leadership styles, um, but you also made the point that, that a, a leader needs to flex their leadership style. That seems to me like a, a tough call how, how does how does a leader do that? Uh, you know, it's um, what we, and so just taking a step back, the stronger our leadership capability, the less management we need for our people. And what that does is it frees up time, it frees up energy, it frees up um, decision-making uh, mind space, which can, uh, create a better outcome in the long run, right? The better we're prepared to make decisions, the better decisions we make, the choices that we make, and therefore the better the outcome. With stronger management, we need less leadership, uh, right? So it's the reverse, but it takes more time and effort and we have to be on top of um, making sure the right person is in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing in the right way. And that is very, um, time intensive and can start to take up some of that energy necessary for making choices, right? Um, and we become uh, 
almost myopic in our decision making and it slows down the whole process okay so that's the big uh, the big concept of of leadership now everybody has different needs and you see that throughout any organization small single office locations all the way through to the large multinational companies the needs of the individuals at each of those locations uh, will then vary based on you know education background age demographic country of origin whatever it may be and if we expect you know 30 people to flex to my single style of leadership we're going to get very frustrated because we're going to find only a small number of people actually operate to the standard that we expect and everybody else is falling below that standard um, that can lead to dysfunction it can lead to poor performance and ultimately it will lead to uh, retention issues how people become better at flexing their leadership style is um uh, it's really quite interesting, um, the M uh, mindfulness, uh, selflessness, and conscientiousness, right, the MSC, um, and that's from the concept, uh, concept in mind of a leader. But if we're mindful of the people around us, and we take the time to act selflessly, and we're conscientious enough to be aware of what the needs are of those people, then we can make decisions and flex our leadership to their need, and give them what they need from a leadership perspective which will elevate their performance and fundamentally if if i want to be successful as a leader and i'm not necessarily seeing that success across the board from my people i should really be holding a mirror up to myself because each of those individuals have been hired perhaps by me and i thought that they were good and it turns out that they're not my perception is they're not good well is that because I'm not leading each of those people in the way they need to be led and you know, delegated to, right? We've got different levels of delegation. If I'm delegating tasks at a higher level than they are able to receive the task, they're going to fail and they're going to repeat repeatedly fail. That will cause a decline in their performance and a disconnection from the organization. So every time that we look at it, if we're able to, um, take the step back and say, what does this individual need from me as a leader? Then you're going to gradually see those results shift and change. And over time, bearing in mind that that aspect of leadership is emotional intelligence and that can be learned, it can be developed and it can be maintained. Then I can change my leadership style. It is generally speaking intellect that's fixed and that is what cannot be shifted, uh, cannot be changed and evolved. You can learn more information, you can understand more, but your intellect generally is fixed. Given that leaders tend to be, um, for lack of a better term, type A type of people, in your experience, how willing are they to change their emotional intelligence or to develop it? So um, what we, what I would suggest is that um, you've got those who are willing to flex and those who are not. And when you look around and we look at the successful leaders within the engineering industry, we see people who have been willing to flex, who um, you, you've you probably heard the term from Jim Collins, level five leaders. They are servant leaders. They are looking to better the organization as a whole. Therefore, they know that people need to be better individually and as a team, we're able to elevate together. And therefore, my role is not to be the person at the front charging the way all the time. Sometimes it's going to be in, in amongst the pack. Sometimes it's going to be at the back. But every time it's making sure that everybody's moving forwards in the right direction. And that is where we have to leave ego at the door. We have to acknowledge at times that we're, we could be wrong. We have to um, constantly be seeking new information, new ways of doing things and questioning ourselves, right? Am I, is, this, is this the right thing to be doing today? Um, and it can be small things. Uh, you know, going into a sales meeting, 
And instead of saying, I'm going to nail this sales call and, and bring this project in, instead say, am I going to nail this sales call and bring this project in? Yes, I am. And I know I am because these are the things which I'm going to make sure that I do. Right. And it just changes the um, mindset before you walk in through the door to that type of situation. And the same is true when we think about our people. How am I going to deal with this person whose performance has declined? Right. That's it. They're fired. Well, OK, really, what's going on when well, we find out that, you know, parents have been sick and this, that and the other. It's like so. actually, if I approach this from a different angle, I may be able to both recover this individual and demonstrate what good leadership is to the rest of the organization and increase my retention just by a few points over the course of a year. On, the, on that point, though, the, the declining uh, performance, I mean, that, one of the big messages in your, that I took away from your talk was that firms wait too long to deal with people with declining performance. I guess what you're saying there is that it's not necessarily you fire someone for declining performance, but you you need to do something. Yeah, and um, what typically, if, if you, <laughs> the number of times I have heard the phrases, oh, thank goodness so-and-so is gone, or uh, my goodness, you know, they've just not been very good for the last six months, and, you know, I don't know what's been going on, but I'm glad that they're gone now whether that person's resigned or been terminated, um, the, either case, that commentary ends up floating to the surface. What I should tell you is six months or more ago, an event occurred. An event occurred for that individual in the way that they perceive and connect with the organization. They started disconnecting from the organization, whatever that reason may be, and as part of that disconnection, their performance then started to decline as well. And rather than uh, nip it in the bud and try and address that head on, right, which requires strong leadership and strong communication skills, we end up leaving those people to languish. Their performance continues to decline. Eventually, we call them in uh, and perhaps give them a personal improvement plan not every firm does that, believe it or not. And they'll allow that performance to continue to slide. And uh, there's some instances uh, with clients that I've worked with um, where they've allowed that performance to slide for two or three years. This is not insignificant amounts of time. Could you imagine paying somebody for three years at even average or above average salary for mediocre performance and constantly cause struggles for you because you're going to have to redo their work every time, right? Those are the choices which firm leaders are making because they want to avoid the conflict, avoid addressing the issue head on. What we know to be true when we um, provide a personal improvement plan, one of two things generally happen. Either an individual will leave because it's really calling to light something they've been denying to themselves for an, a good while in that they have disconnected from the organization. My performance has slid. I'm not happy with myself. And now they know. And because they know, I can't take them knowing. Therefore, I'm going to resign. Right. And, and they'll leave before that personal improvement plan has fully uh, flushed out over whatever time period you choose. The other outcome is that an individual will suddenly realize, oh, you're right, I have been declining in my performance. It's, um, you know, I'm willing to put in the effort to, to bring it back up. That then will result in two other outcomes. They'll either also re-engage with the organization and stay for quite a significant period of time, or they'll get to the end of their improvement plan be determined to have been successful and then immediately start sliding off again and leave you with very little choice but to let them go. It is rare at the provision of a, a personal improvement plan that the individual will stay, not improve, and cause you to terminate for that lack of performance. It does happen. It's just not very likely. 
that's just human nature. Another point you made, which I thought was interesting, was that the average age of uh, firm founders is 31, which to my mind, you, you're an engineering firm, you hired someone at 24. So your peak performers are leaving at 31. How, how do you, these are the guys you want to, or, or the gals you want to keep, but they're leaving. How do you keep them? Or do you, are you able to keep them? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, when you look at some of the firms that were perhaps founded now uh, in the early 80s, they'll have gone through their uh, transition to second, perhaps even third generation by this point. What that looks like is those second generation owners tend to be 42, right? By the time they're invited to become owners. Why is that? A firm founder tends to be entrepreneurial, risk-taking, willing to put themselves out there, can bring the work in, can do the work, right? They're the all-star performers. The second generation folks are the people who are there at the beginning, who the first generation owner leaned on to do the work, deliver the work, QAQC it, make sure the clients were happy. And so that second generation ownership group tends to be more of the lieutenants, right? The people who can do the work, make it happen. And their reward eventually is some ownership in the organization, right? As the first generation owner is either at or well above their peer group. During that time period, you will have had the attrition occur of those potential future owners as they get to 30, 31, 32, 34, 35, say, do you know what? There's no chance I'm ever going to get an owner. I'm not waiting until I'm 42. I'm going to go and start my own firm or join a, another firm where I can be an owner. The third generation looks and feels like the first generation. But they've had to overcome, the first generation's had to overcome the obstacles of a, starting a business. All those brick walls, they've broken through them they've got over the speed bumps they are making it happen they've climbed the mountains the third generation owners don't have to do that right they're coming in as owners potentially they're still in that younger generation they're entrepreneurial they're risk-taking but they don't have the headwinds that the first generation owners had and so they can't understand why the first and second generation owners would look at them and say you know what you just don't have it yet and so they'll go and start their own firm and become a first generation owner. What we, what I am suggesting we're seeing now with several things happening, we have the overall starting decline in the working age um, population. Uh, and I went through that ACEC Georgia summer conference a couple of years ago. Um, but over the next 15, 20 years, we're going to lose a significant population from the workforce. The average age of engineers is going to increase by another 10 years. And we've got fewer engineers coming through uh, schools into the building engineering professions. Those three things combined are going to make it harder and harder for anybody beyond the age of 35 to really come into ownership and be able to steer the ship forwards. Um, because it's just not, there's essentially going to be this misgeneration. And that's gonna be likely the late Gen Xers, the early Gen Yers, and it's gonna skip down to, to the millennials. Um, you know, it, essentially, I was an example of that. I was 29 when I became general manager of my engineering office. And, and that was a way that that um, ownership group was able to retain me, was rewarding me with the position and the role which I would otherwise be able to go and achieve by myself. Right. So we're going to need to start keeping our eyes peeled. Though, If we're thinking that our ownership transition is five to 10 years away, the people that are likely to be that uh, answer, that solution, who can really steer the ship are maybe 24, 25 years old today. On that, uh, you were talking about the characteristics of great leaders and, and you've talked about focus, speed, and agility um, as a personality trait. Mm -hmm. uh, that, um, if I'm a owner and I'm looking through my staff, 
how do I pick that trait out out amongst all the technical skills and the other personality skills? You know, um, so if we think about focus speed and focus agility, it is the, you know, the, the focus speed. I'm able to um, look at something and very quickly, get up to speed with where I need to be and move that item forwards and move it forwards effectively. Um, agility is going to be the moving from one thing to another to another, right? So um, when I think about that, that's going to be reviewing a, a proposal and contract for you know 15, 30 minutes and then move on to looking at the overall financials for a large scale project, then going on to a meeting and be able to facilitate and lead a meeting well, and then go on to mentoring one of the junior staff members in a calculation process that seems to be particularly complex, right? Over the course of two hours, that individual is covering four very different topics of leadership and doing it seamlessly and to a very high standard. Um, that is oftentimes necessary when you think about um, when you, you know, as, a, as an engineering leader, you go away on a site visit for two or three days, you come back to your office, you sit down, you look up, and this is obviously pre-pandemic, there's six people standing in line at your door, ready to talk to you about the different things that you uh, need to provide input on since your um, site visit. And you suddenly get bombarded with questions, technical questions, then um, you know, uh, legal related questions, then a client problem, then a communication issue. And within that time period, you've got to flip between those topics very quickly. Who can do that in the organization? Who can take one of those topics and very quickly move it forward to conclusion and provide the necessary direction in a way that is a learning moment for the individuals that they're communicating with? It's not dictation, it is encouragement for solution. And that skill sort of bubbles to the top if you're looking? Absolutely. Um, and and it will show up in uh, odd uh, moments for junior staff. You know, you suddenly hear about, uh, you know, Simon is uh, taking it upon himself to be the, um, be on the board of the local charity that's building a community center. Huh, that's interesting. But that's on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, he happens to be going to a networking event. Well, Simon, Simon seems to be involved in a lot of different things. Let me look at his work product. Wow, this is outstanding. I'm surprised he knew this much about X, Y, and Z topic, right? Simon must be a really interesting person. But he's three years out of school. Why would I give him the time of day as a potential future leader? So to, to close up here, um, so attrition uh, from a from a firm um, is is damaging, obviously. And you made the point, and I thought it was interesting that um, if you're trying to grow, not only do you have to hire people, but you have to limit attrition. Yeah. In the stuff we've talked about, and or something we haven't talked about, what what are the limit? What are the the limits to attrition that that firms you know should at least have a to do list on? Sure. Um, so you know, one of the questions that was raised during the presentation is what do you define as attrition, right? What, what, is, what are we talking about here? And the reason that was important, most firms say we've got a 95% retention rate. And what they're saying is um, we're only losing five people from voluntary reasons. Everybody else, we're terminating for cause or they're moving because they're uh, going to Idaho or, you know, going to Georgia or wherever it happens to be. And there's reasons why they cull out those folks so that the numbers look great and it's presented to the principals and the principals go, wow, we've got, we've got 95% retention. You strip out all of those people that are leaving for um, voluntary resignations, terminations, even um, families moving to the other side of the country would be something that would be interesting for this purpose. And all of a sudden our attrition rates 20%. Well, that can be very expensive and it, it's very disruptive, right? It's disruptive to the people that remain. And what 
you tend to see is, and you can go back, any of the people listening can go back to their HR data and look at their attrition rate. And if they see, have felt that it's higher recently, they can go back and it might start 10%, 12%, 15%, 18%, 22%, right? It can ramp up over a number of years and they can stay there until something's really done about it. So if you're looking to grow by 5% and add five staff, but your attrition is 15%, you've got to hire 20 people. That's expensive and time consuming. And so some small things that you can do. First of all, make sure that your hiring process is looking to uh, bring people in that are fully aligned with the organization and fit, right? And so that's a structured hiring process that can be consistent and you can repeat and replicate and, and produce consistent results and be there for the onboarding process so that that anchor bias is set high. The second thing is keep attuned to your people. That means talking to them. Some firms like to use tools and products, some for which are, is interesting as well, because as engineers, while we don't like to talk to people frequently, when we don't talk to people frequently, we get frustrated. And so um, that will probably include regular check-ins and making sure that we're talking about not just work things, right? Can I understand where these people are coming from? Can I understand what their needs are? And am I meeting their needs? And then what we'll tend to see is, uh, and, and this was kind of touched on at the end, the overall list of why people remain if the projects aren't the projects that I want to be working on and I've been pigeonholed into something that I dislike, I'm going to disconnect. If I don't have a voice in my professional destiny, I'm going to disconnect. Um, what's the leadership? Am I aligned with the values of the organization? Do I enjoy the people and the culture, right? The culture of my office, the colleagues that I work with. Am I recognized and rewarded for my contribution to the firm's success? Um, there's nothing like, you know, bringing in a multi-million dollar project or, you know, uh, delivering a great work product that's got no comments, uh, you know, for, uh, as a permit set and people turn around and go, oh, yeah, right. You want to, you want some recognition. You, you know, it doesn't need to be big monetary rewards. People will work and be rewarded with items of unequal value. Congratulations for bringing that multi-million dollar project in. Here's a hundred dollar bones gift card. Go and take your spouse out for dinner, right? It, it, you know, that's completely disproportionate, but it's a small gesture that can really reward that and recognize that contribution. So, you know, if you've got that high attrition, 15, 20%, um, I would be doing a lot of looking in the mirror, right? And really looking at every part of my organization and my practice to understand where this is going wrong. And even if people are giving you the excuse while well, we're moving to a different area of the country, why was I not aware of this when that topic first came up before they even went out for the interview and look at houses? Because if it was a rock star and somebody I wanted to keep, my answer is more likely to be, especially because of the current circumstances and use of video conferencing, we will keep you in the organization regardless of where you sit and you keep that additional individual. Well, that's a good, way to, good place to end. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us about this. We've been talking to uh, Simon Goodhead, who's a principal at the Cox Group in Atlanta. Thank you. Thank Simon. you very much. Appreciate your time.